are tuning in or who will watch this at a later time. We are honored of the Lord today to be here, and I am excited to have a brother, a friend, one that is my fellow co-laborer in the gospel of Jesus Christ, Elder Lafayette Lane, and we will be discussing the importance of good leadership. I'm going to give him an opportunity to introduce himself, but first of all, I will say that uh, my name is Minister George Bowden, Elder George Bowden uh, of the Ohio District Council, PAW. Uh, we met during the pandemic. That's right. That's uh, right. Virtually. He's right. uh, taught Bible study, prayer calls, and we've been able to uh, develop a brotherhood. So I'm just excited yeah. to have him, man. He'll introduce himself. Absolutely, bro. And I'm excited to be here. Before I introduce myself, I want to yes. say thank you to you, Brother George, yes. and to your amazing platform, A Call God to Be, be Different Lord. Ministries. Yes. You are doing a great work. And I would say to you, like you know, the Lord said to Nehemiah, yes. you're doing a great work and don't come down. Thank you, Jesus. As you've already said, my name is Elder Lafayette Lane. Excited to be here, Elder Preacher in the, the Lord's Church. That's right. Uh, father, husband, right. IT professional. Right. Uh, also, I'm the host of a Unscripted Authentic Leadership podcast. Yes. And uh, much more, but I'm excited to get into the conversation, yes. man. Let's, 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 let's dive in. Yeah. So my first question to you, uh, when you think of the word leadership, what is the first thing that comes to mind? Good leadership. Good leadership, yes. yes. When I think of the word leadership, I think of that word ship that we see in that word leadership. And a ship does several things. A ship is designed as a vessel, right. as we should be as leaders, we should be vessels. But also a ship is designed to carry resources, whether that be food, uh, uh, exports, imports, uh, things that people need or a group of people need in order for survival and a quality of life. But also a ship is used to carry passengers, uh, uh, large groups of people to a designated uh, destination um, that is intended for their life. And that's how we should be as leaders. So when we look at that, I break down leadership as what, who, and why. Right. So what are you carrying as a leader? What are you carrying inside of you to the people that you have been anointed and called by God to lead uh, for their lives? What are you carrying, that, whether that be knowledge, wisdom, um, the resources that they need in order to be successful in their life, um, the information, the anointing that's on your life, is what they need. Number two, who are you leading? Because I believe if we're going to be good leadership, as you quantified that, uh, good leaders, we have to make sure that we are not trying to lead and reach people that God has not assigned to our voice. That's good. So we have to make sure that we understand and know who we are leading. And last but not least, why are we leading the way that we do? In other words, we gotta check our motives. Wow, wow. So in today's time, a lot of people, they, everybody has been called to preach. Everybody has been called to lead. So <laughs> what would you say to those that may have been called to preach or may have the desire to preach? How, how would you, how can I present this? What advice would you give to them that some want to pastor, some just want to preach, but when you look at the grounds of leadership, what, what, what avenues would you give to them when trying to quantify whether they're a good leader or, you know, the pendulum are there. Sure, sure. And, and because we're talking yet about this from a spiritual yes. context, just because you've been called to preach does right. not mean you've been called to lead. That's so true. Just because you've been called to preach does not mean you've been called to pastor. Right. Just because you've been called to preach does not mean you've been called to be a leader over a church or a leader right. over an organization. I think that when you quantify the leadership from the preaching aspect, the difference is the motive of why you're doing what mm -hmm. you're doing. So leadership is servitude, right? And so if you don't have a servant's heart and your motive is not to serve other people, then leadership is not for you. Right. If you're not willing to have sacrifice, if you're not willing to understand that leadership is bleedership, I, I put it that way, in other words, that sometimes your sacrifice will cause you to bleed in order to help right. others heal, right. in order to help them lead them effectively in the way that they need to be led, it is, comes from a place of sacrifice. Right. So if you can answer that question of, am I willing to uh, put myself secondary? If the answer is no, then leadership is not for you. So you're saying a good leader always puts himself first? Absolutely. When we look at the... the the example of scripture, right? 
of Jesus Christ, who was the ultimate leader, the ultimate servant. Jesus came to serve. Right. When he was sitting with the publicans and sinners and, and the Sadducees, the religious right. people were asking, what are you right. doing? Right. He said, I didn't come for those that are well. <laughs> there you go. I came for those that are sick. Right. In other words, I came to deal with those that have issues. Right. I came to deal with those that have problems, that are dealing with anxiety, that are dealing with struggles that they feel like they can't break free from. In order to effectively deal with people that have problems, you have to be a person that has solutions. Come on, come on. <laughs> and, and not just there for a microphone right. or a light or right. to be put on a flyer right. or to be put on a certain stage. Right. Because of the reality is you spend more time off the stage than you do on the <laughs> stage. Come on, right. And so if your private life mm -hmm. of leadership is off, it will show in a public forum. Right. So you have to check your motive and really check your intention that if you desire leadership, that is a great thing because I believe that We've all been called to lead on a certain level, right. but leadership is not for everybody, right? right? right. So you have to act, ask yourself, know yourself and know what you're capable of doing and know most importantly what God has called you to do. Right. God may have not called you to be a senior pastor. He may have called you to be a social media manager. He mm -hmm. may have called you to deal with the children's church. Right. The importance is we all are the body of Christ. Right and no one position is more important than the other. Right. You may be the head, I may be the arm, and, and another person may be the neck, another person may need, be, need the foot. We don't all have to be the head because somebody has to do the walking and somebody has to do the talking. Wow. Altar call, <laughs> will you come? This is good. So can you be a good leader if you're arrogant? Mm. Can you be a good leader if you, uh, Let's talk about that because a lot of leaders, they get into positions and they become so big. They can't praise the Lord. They can't, <laughs> you know, go out into the hedges and highways. So when sure. we look at leadership, I mean, can you be a leader and be arrogant? You can. Does be. that define a good leader, though? I would not define a good leader as an arrogant leader, but we have seen leadership that has been arrogant. Yeah and been successful in their arrogant, okay. arrogancy. Okay. But at the end of the day, we have to check our motive by the motive of God. Right. I think in order to be in leadership, there is a certain level of confidence right. that you need to have. Mm -hmm. Because you are on the front lines, which is what leadership is, that everything starts and should end with you. So if there's a win, it's because we won as a team, but if there's right. a loss, they're gonna be looking at you. Right. And you should be able to have that accountability. Right you have to have a certain level of confidence to walk in that because you're going to be the one that's going to be one that's taking the brunt of the, the, the losses. That's right. And the, uh, the bloggers right. and right. The, the, those that are talking about you on social media. Right. Right. So you have to have your confidence in the Lord. Yeah. Right. But we have to be careful that our confidence and arrogance oftentimes are almost like twins, I right? See. There's a, there's a, there's a, Thin line yes, yes. between confidence and arrogance that right. it's easy for us to fall into. Right. And, and, and we've all been there. We've all been and there. And we have to humble ourselves to the point to where we keep ourselves in a place to where God has me in this position, not for me, but to help somebody or to help somebodies to help them be better. I see. We say all the time that we're blessed to be a blessing. Yeah. Well, we're, we've been blessed to be in leadership so we can call somebody out so they can be a leader. Yeah. Because the ultimate, for me, the, one of the signs of successful and good leadership is you can develop another person that was not a leader right. initially when you met them. Right. But by the time you get done developing them and empowering them and leading them the way that God has anointed and assigned you to do, they can now go lead at somebody else. That's good. That's, that, that's really good. Yeah. Because like you said, that or, re, say what you just said, uh, arrogance and confidence. They're twins. Yeah. Wow. Not identical. Yeah. <laughs> They're fraternal. Yeah. <laughs> and oftentimes we can blur the lines to where we can't, am I walking in arrogance or am I walking in confidence? I see. Because we want to be confident to the point, you know, people have, have come up to you, I've heard you, I'm sure you've heard them tell you, you know, stay humble, son. That's right. That's there are right. two types of people that will tell you that, that I've, I've, I've learned. Yeah. Number one, there's the type of people that will tell you to be humble because they genuinely want you to stay humble. I believe that. Under the hand of God. Right. But then there's a group of people that will tell you to be humble 
because they want you to stay at a level that as long as you're where they are, wow. they're okay with you. Wow. But as soon as you start elevating and growing and developing to the places yeah. where God has called you to yeah. be, now they call you arrogant. When it's not arrogancy, it's just confidence and I'm walking in the true God. That, I see. The calling that God has called me. Right. For, right? Yeah. And so we have to, again, yeah. th those lines can be blurred sometimes. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, it's not what the people say. It's about what God says. Wow. And if God has said that you have been called to do this, you've been called to go to this certain level, the Bible says humble yourselves under the, the hand, hand of, God. of God. He'll exalt you in due time. Yeah. So don't worry about what the people say. Yeah. As long as you stay under the hand of God, God will elevate you. Let them talk. That's You'll right. be all right. That's good. And, and when we look at the next question about discipleship, so mm -hmm. when we look at the word discipleship, what is the first thing that comes to your mind when you think of a discipleship or someone being discipled? Connections. Okay. Relationship. Okay. And again, let's look at the Bible. Right? Yes. When we look at the ministry of Jesus, three and a half, earth, three and a half year earthly ministry, mm -hmm. he walked with the disciples. Right. He talked with the disciples. He ate with them. He demonstrated to them what walking with God literally was like. Right. Because they were literally walking with God. Right. And he was showing them not just how to do church. Yes. Because I think when we disciple people, we want to teach them how to do church. Oh my God. Teach them you got to speak in tongues. Right. Which is important. Right. But we have not taught them how to walk in life. Right. And Jesus was trying to teach the disciples what he's trying to teach to us so we can teach and disciple other people how to live life while you're on earth. Yeah. So how to walk with God even when you're having a bad day. Yes. How to walk with God even when depression is trying to pull on you. Come on. Discipleship is connection and relationship. So it has to go outside of the Sunday morning worship experience. Right. right. It has to go outside of the Bible study or the outreach event. If you are not checking in and developing relationships with people outside of that, I question whether you want to disciple them or whether you just want a member. My God. Because a lot of times we have, again, we blurred the lines right. of membership and discipleship. Right. There's a lot of members, but not a lot of disciples. Yeah. yeah. When we see that, that word discipleship, something that the Lord's been dealing with me about, George, is in that word discipleship is where we get our word discipline. Yes. And there's a lot of people that say that we are disciples of Christ, but we are not disciplined. Right. We're not disciplined in our appetites. We're not disciplined in our devotion. We're not disciplined in our walk and our lifestyle with God. And even in our walk with other people, it is amazing to me how many people speak in tongues, but cannot speak in English to one another. Right. My question is that is how is that? How are you going to win the world if you don't have a language and a communication? to disciple other people. Yeah. It's okay for you to speak in tongues, but you and I both work in corporate America. Right. You can't do that on your time. <laughs> no. You cannot disciple people in the boardroom right. with Acts 2.38. Right. You have to live a life and develop there a relationship go. with them there you to go. where they can understand the language. It's right. amazing that we always look at the upper room experience mm -hmm. and we talk about the speaking in tongues, but we gloss over the part where it says, they all spoke in other tongues and they understood each other right. from different nations and different areas. Right. In other words, whatever context I go into, I should be able to understand and relate to their language. Right. That's discipleship, relationship, connectivity, and relatability. Relatability. And, and the, the importance of that is, like you said, I can't go on the WebEx Monday morning speaking in other tongues. They're going to say either... He got a hold of some bad drugs <laughs> or he's lost his mind. Yeah. And then I will get fired. Exactly. <laughs> but it's it's understanding that you have to be relatable in such a way that as soon as you walk in the door, and and I this is as transparent as we can possibly be. Sure. They'll say there's something different about this young man That's right. or this young lady. That's right. You don't have to tell them what church you go to, you don't have to be braggadocious on who your pastor is, right. but like you said, be humble and let God do the elevating. Exactly. And I think when we look at the importance of good leadership, and I'm not going to go off on a tangent here, but <laughs> we have to understand that we're living in a generation and time. This generation cares little to nothing about church. Mm -hmm. People on the job, they're talking about this, that, and the other. Sure. Church is just a small 
part of their lives. Absolutely. But when we look at just being relatable, uh, this is not on our interview question, but when we no. look at this generation, how important is it for you to be relatable to people that are caught up in these same sex love affairs? Yeah. They're hooked on what we used to call the can't help it. <laughs> I understand they, no, if you can't help it, you just can't help it. <laughs> but drugs, what would you, what advice or how, how, how are you relating to them nowadays? I think we have complicated witnessing. Right. To where because they don't struggle the way that we have struggled right. or we continue to struggle, right. their struggles and our struggle, then we feel like we cannot relate to them. The reality is seeing is sin. Come on. And so we have to put ourselves in a place to where we're not angelic in our mm -hmm. presentation. Thank you. Or we're, we're coming across as holier than thou. Right. Paul says to, to them, to all men, I become all things right. so I can become relatable. Right. Right. And so really it's, and I, I like this word transparency. Yeah. We have to be careful with that though, right? Okay. But transparent to the point to tell them I'm saved but I have struggled and I'm still struggling with Come some on. things Come that on. God has helped me walk right. through. Right. I still deal with some of the same things that you deal with. Right. The difference is I know where to go for help. Yes. I know where to go for a solution. Right. So it's being real with people because a lot of times people in the world know the real from the fake. There you go. Right? Yep. So if you're just coming across to them trying to say, hey, you just need to be saved. Hey, what you're doing is wrong. You're just pointing out problems but you're not providing solutions. Right. right. So if you're, again, we're talking about leadership. If you're going to lead them to Christ, then you have to show them what Christ is able to do for them. Oftentimes, it's not that they don't want Christ. They don't want our presentation of the right. Christ that we're presenting right. to them. Right. Our presentation is off. Right. We often talk about the Jehovah Witnesses, all these other denominations, but they have a better presentation of what yes, they, they believe do. in than we do. Right. So really, the responsibility is not on the sinner that does not want to be saved. We need to put the responsibility of those that are saved on the presentation that we are presenting to those we are trying to win. So how do you reach this next generation that don't want to come to church? If it's not through a URL link, they don't want to join your service. So right. what are you doing with <coughs> your minister group, your servanthood to reach this generation yes. that's like, I get up, play my PS5, <laughs> I go down to North Market, give me a fish sandwich, uh -huh. go back home. How are we reaching them? You have to meet them where they are. Okay. Jesus called us fishers of men. Right. Or fishermen. Right. And a good fisherman understands I can't use the same bait for every fish. Right. I have to give them not the bait that I want, but the bait that they will receive. Right. Again, our presentation has often come from a place, George, we can't win them because we're trying to win them the way that we want them to be won. Right. Right. Or we're trying to catch them and clean them. Mm. As a fisherman, it is not my job is when, I, when I'm going out and witnessing or trying to win a soul, it's not my job to clean. Right. It's my job to catch. Right. So if they are in the pool of social media, if they are in the pool or the lake of Instagram and Facebook, then if I have to do a virtual event, I will do it, that's even good. if that's not my preference. Right. Right. But it's the way that I can win them. Mm -hmm. And if I go to where they are, I'm not compromising my beliefs if I do that. Right. Then they'll be more open mm -hmm. to, hey, won't, next Sunday, won't you come in person? Yeah. They'll say, okay, yeah, I, I'll come. Yeah. Why? Because you went to them first. Right. Right. You were open and, and not trying to bend them to what your preference is. And I yeah. say that so importantly because I think we've made a distinction of, things that are of God, that are in the word of God, and things that are just our preference, right. that we are saying that are ungodly too. Right. <laughs> There's a difference, <laughs> right? Right. right. So, so we have to move our preferences out of the way yes. and go get the fish. Yes, and that, that's very important because as a good leader, mm -hmm. there are some things that you're going to have to do in order to win souls. Not, we say we're not going to compromise our salvation. We're not that's right. going to compromise the word of God, but if God sends you out west to witness, then you should be able to get up, take your Bible, take a few people that have prayed and do that. Right. If you have to go to, down to Short North and witness right. to the people, you, you should be able to do that as a good leader. And showing that example gives other people an opportunity and the desire 
to, to do that. That's right. So my next question to you, you being raised in the church, and I know that your, your mother and your father, uh, they are preachers. Mm -hmm. um, what, what examples have they given to you to help develop you as a good leader, as a good, good preacher? I think they gave me the word of God. Good. They were God. Okay. Um, which is the most important thing that we can give. You talked about the father and the mother mm -hmm. to our next generation. Right. Because a lot of times I think we've over use that word millennial and this generation and the next generation. You and <laughs> right, I, I'm right. 28, I'm almost 30, right. I have a, a wife and kids. Right. You're around the same age. Right. So really, we're talking about not necessarily us, even though we're still young. Yeah. We're talking about the next generation. Right. And right. how can we give them God? Yes. The greatest gift I can give my children is God. Thank you. The greatest gift that we can give the next generation is God. Because if we give them God, I didn't say give them us. Right. And our, again, our preferences and our desires, if we give them God, we'll be okay. I'm reminded of Hannah. That's right. Who, who was barren for so long. Yes. And the Lord finally granted her request to have a child. Right. And when she has that child who becomes the prophet Samuel, she says, Lord, I'm giving him back, back to you. you. Right. If you allow me to give, if you allow me to give birth to this baby, I'm going to give them back to you. Yes. So that's what we have to do. This next generation, this generation, or whatever generation is to come, they don't belong to us. They belong to God. So let's give them back to the rightful owner. That's good. Wow. Wow. You said a, a yeah. mouthful there. And I think it's important when we discuss the importance of good leadership, we look at all dynamics because us being in the corporate world and then us being leaders within our churches yeah. i mean there's no difference because you're still exactly. dealing with people from your from day-to-day -day life yes but when we look at the importance of good leadership when it comes to leading people yeah <laughs> what would you describe and we don't always hear about this but what would you describe as a bad leader oh god <laughs> <laughs> one of my favorite books is a book on leadership entitled Surrounded by Idiots. Okay. And those of you that are watching this, please go read that book. I have to get it. <laughs> and, it and it talks about the four personalities of people, whether you'll be a red, okay. yellow, green, or blue. Okay. And those different colors <laughs> represent, right. uh, yellow is more of a creative person. Okay. Uh, green is more of a outgoing person blue is analytical and red is a person that likes to be in control <laughs> right so right. so i find myself in, in a little bit of red and a little sure. bit of this or you may have so so when we're dealing with people what makes bad leadership is that you don't know how to deal with the person that you're dealing with okay the way that i deal with you george right is not the way that i can deal with someone else right so i have to understand those different colors i have to understand what makes you tick have to understand what's the best communication style to communicate with you. You may not receive, George, I need you to do this. You may not receive that. I may have to present it a different way, but a bad leader will try to get you to conform to the right. way that I'm trying to force you right. to receive the communication right. I'm doing. But it's not about me trying to be a bad leader or a good leader. I just want to be effective. Yeah. Because what matters is the result, mm -hmm. right? So if I have to, uh, you may prefer an email over a in-person right. one-on-one meeting. Yeah. So I'm going to do that for you. Yeah. And then so-and-so over here may prefer this. As long as we get the desired result accomplished, that's all that should matter. So my suggestion, again, read the book, Surrounded by Idiots. Yeah. But a lot of times bad leadership is trying to force people into receiving the communication in the way that we desire to lead them instead of trying to meet them in the way they can receive our leading. Hmm. Wow. So with that, mm -hmm. can bad leaders produce good leaders? Whew. Okay, George, you go to this today. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, think, I think change is possible okay. for anyone. People would look at Adolf Hitler as a bad leader. Right. When in all actuality, he was a great leader. Mm -hmm. What he did was bad. Right. He would be deemed as bad leadership, but his results were great. Right. What, what do I mean by that? He was able to get people, even though the intent of what he did was wrong. Right. He was able to get a mass amount of people to do or execute a desired goal. 
So bad leadership can still get results. And that's where we have to be careful because even the enemy, the devil himself, right. he's evil, right. but he gets results right. oftentimes more than we do. Right. Wow. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so my next question to you is when we look at the word vision, mm. and we discussed this earlier about uh, without a vision, the people perish. Yes. How important is it for a good leader to have a vision. Oftentimes we hear of our jobs ask us, what do we want to do in the next one or two <laughs> years, three yeah. or four years, five years, in my opinion, they're asking to see if you're going to be there or not. Right. But how important is it for one, as a being a good leader, to have a vision? It's critical. Mm -hmm. I, I would suggest you are going to lead yourself into a ditch where there is no vision. Right. The Bible says the blind lead the blind and right. they fall into a ditch. Right. And then we look at the scripture where it says write the vision. Yes. Make it plain right. so those that read the vision can run with the vision. Right. You cannot lead your family. You cannot lead yourself. Mm -hmm. Before you start leading people, and that's a whole other discussion for another time, you have to learn to effectively lead yourself. Wow. You can't lead yourself, number one. And if you can't lead, your, lead yourself, you can't lead people. Wow. You can't lead your family. You I can't see. lead an organization mm -hmm. if there is no vision. Right. Because a vision gives clarity and direction. Right? It, it, a vision is different than sight. Mm -hmm. A blind man can have vision even right. though he does not have sight. Right. Because a vision does not necessarily require the seeing of the eyes. Right. Vision comes from a revelation of what has been revealed to you from a down low, I believe, from God. What happens oftentimes though, George, is that we don't have a vision. It's not that we lack vision, is that we leave the vision in our head. But the scripture says, write the vision. Make it plain. So we never transfer the vision from the head mm -hmm. to the hand. Mm -hmm. So we are, our hand is empty and our lives are empty because we have not begin to write. And if we don't begin to write, there's no way we can begin to run. When you read the vision, you can run with the vision, but you have to write for what you have reve been revealed and what you have received from God. Oh, wow. We have a lot of leaders that have a lot of great ideas, a lot of vision in their head, but there's no results. And a lot of times we feel like a failure because things are not working. Right. Well, it's because it's all in your head and you have not clarified. Right. The thing about when it goes from your head to your hand is that it simplifies and it clarifies and gives direction so you can be singularly focused. A lot of times when we have a lot of vision in our head, we have a thousand different things. That's right. You're, you're a fellow visionary, so yeah. you know oh, yeah. there's a lot of different things. Man, I want to do this. Yep. I want to I open up a studio. Yes. I want to write this. Yes. I, yes. I want to open up a church. I want to yeah. do this. Yeah. <laughs> and, and you're so scatterbrained, scatterbrained. that so your true. vision can't even be clear enough right. for you to write. So when right. someone asks you, what's your vision? You're like, uh, uh, I want to. So true. So you got to get singularly focused. Right. And another thing the Lord told me a, a long time ago when it comes to vision, we have a lot of good ideas, but not a lot of God ideas. A lot of good ideas and a lot of God, not a lot of God ideas. So when our ideas don't come to fruition or we, it doesn't pan out the way that we don't think that it should, then we feel like a failure. Mm -hmm. When in reality, we have to do some self-accountability and say, maybe that idea that I went with was not necessarily a God idea, it was a good idea. Yeah. That's a lot of good ideas. Yeah. And it sounds good. You, yeah. you go to tell somebody an idea that you want to do, I mean, that's a good idea. Right. But God will tell you that's not the God idea I have for you. Right. So you have to be clear on your vision, clear in the distinction between you and what God is saying for your life. Not that God cannot use your ambition mm -hmm. and your drive, because I believe he can, but you have to make sure that is the will of God for your life. Right. So when we look at vision, we, we know we have to have a good vision, a purpose mm -hmm. uh, for understanding where God wants to use us and take us. So when it comes to a prayer life mm -hmm. of, of, uh, for a good leader, excuse me, how important is it for us as leaders to have a prayer life? Because oh, God. It, it's easy to preach in A flat <laughs> if you're a good preacher. I wouldn't say easy. But if you skill yourself uh, well enough to do these things, right. but then you have no prayer life when depression is knocking at your door, when you're about to be fired on your job, yeah. uh, we all go through issues of life, yeah. but how important is it 
for a good leader or just for anybody to develop and have a prayer life? Absolutely. You shouldn't just have a good prayer life because you want to preach. Come on. If you are gifted to preach, yeah. I, could, I would suggest you can <laughs> preach without praying. <laughs> right. Because you just have the gift to right. do it. You right. have the gift right. to effectively communicate, right. to effectively connect with an audience. Right. And if you have a little tune in you, you know, you could do, you said A flat, yeah. E flat, C sharp, <laughs> you right. know, whatever key right. that you're in, you yeah. can modulate. Yeah. And that's, I love it all. Right. But at the end of the day, when we're done preaching and before we started preaching, after we're done preaching, we have to have prayer. Yeah. I preached a message uh, from Luke chapter 11 where the disciples, uh, Jesus had went away to mm -hmm. a mountain mm -hmm. and the disciples were there and they asked Jesus, teach us to pray. To pray. We've often uh, misinterpreted or misquoted that text and we say the disciples asked Jesus, teach us how to pray. Right. That's not what they said. Yeah. They said, teach us to pray. Mm -hmm. In other words, the how is the style, right. which we see a lot in church. Right. Right. We've got the formality, we've yeah. got the cadence, yeah. we know when to say hallelujah, yeah. we know when yeah. to say glory, yeah. Yeah. we know when to shift our voice, right. we know when to go into <laughs> high gear. Yes, sir. But we're lacking the discipline to do it. They asked Jesus, teach us to, to pray. pray. In other words, literally teach us to be disciplined enough to pray. And a lot of times we have missed that as leaders, that if we have no prayer, how do we have a vision? Mm. How do we have a revelation? Because if we don't have prayer, where are we digging from? That's where we get into that other blurred line of pride and self-ambition and self-will. Because if, you're not, if you don't have a prayer life, you're now drawing from a well of self. Right. So when you preach, you're, you're preaching from a, a good idea. Right. <laughs> when you lead, you're, you're, you're leading on people and you're saying things that you shouldn't say right. because you're, you're drawing from a well that's flesh yeah. instead of prayer. Prayer keeps you disciplined and prayer keeps you in a place to where you understand without God, literally, I could do nothing. For it is in him that we live, we move, and have our being, right? Right. So prayer is absolutely essential in a time to where we talk about essential workers. Right, that's <laughs> so We talk true. about uh, uh, essential practices mm -hmm. and essential guidelines mm -hmm. and essential restrictions. The thing that has become not essential is prayer. Right. But Second Chronicles is still correct. That's if right. my people, which are called by, which my, are called name. by my name, right. would humble themselves and pray, right. seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, God says, I'll hear from heaven, I'll forgive their sins, and I'll heal, heal the land. land. Right. And that's important because when we look at leadership, oftentimes we look at everybody's not perfect, nobody's perfect. That's right. But how important is it for a leader to be able to say, I'm sorry, I Ooh. failed, I made the mistake. How important is that when we, because we look at the highs of leadership, everybody sees the glitz, the yes. glamour, the lights, the flyers, but when a leader makes some mistakes or makes a wrong, that's right. Uh, you know, they may say something out of turn or out of order. How important is it for a leader in this day and time to, to go back and just say, hey, I messed up? It's absolutely important. It's hard for me or anybody else to respect a leader that cannot be honest. Right. Because you want me to receive rebuke from you when I'm right. wrong. Right. Well, when you're wrong, you can't say that. Right. And that's not a leader that is effective and that's a good leader and that will last long. So we have to be in a place to where, again, we keep our motives in check to say, Lord, I repent. Lord, yes. keep me in a place to where I know that I'm wrong. Right. right. Keep me in a place to where just because I'm in leadership doesn't mean I can't receive correction. Right. If, if I'm leading you or I'm leading a group of people, you should be able to check me and say, hey, man, I don't think you should have said that the right way. <laughs> right. And I should be able to say, okay. I can go back and review that and say, okay, you know what, you're right. So that makes it, it doesn't do anything but strengthen our leadership. Mm -hmm. But especially as men, sometimes our pride can get punctured. Right, right. right? So we have an ego trip. Right. You can't tell me to say, right. you know, who are you to tell me? Yeah. I'm over you. Yeah. When leadership is not about being over, it's really about being under. Mm -hmm. And when you're submitted, you have no, no problem or no time uh, 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 receiving the, hey, an apology is necessary, or hey, I could have did this, or I could have said this. A different way yeah when, when we look at the word pride <laughs> yeah. when, when did that become such a, a a daunting thing where it's just like nobody can say nothing to nobody when did that well 
we've been dealing that with that before we got here, George. I see. Satan. Right. Got lifted up in pride. Right. To where I, I, I am the most high. That's I'll right. be greater so I can pull down a, a third of heaven yeah. with me. Yeah. So pride has got us from the beginning. There was one of those three things that's going to get you, right? The lust of the flesh, the lust yeah. of the eyes, or the pride of life. Right. And pride has no place in effective and good leadership, as we've said before. Because pride go up before destruction. That's right. Uh, uh, pride go up before the fall. Right. The day that you start getting lifted up in pride is the day that the leadership and the position starts to get removed from you. If you don't catch yourself and put yourself in a place of repentance to say, whoa, I got lifted up. Lord, I'm sorry. Yeah. And it's so easy because God will forgive you. Yeah. But we have to get to the place and say, I'm wrong. Right. Right. And remove pride from our agenda. Right. Okay. One last question for you. And because Elder has, has preached several oh, no, hundred no, no, messages no, no. No. within <laughs> one 30 minute segment. <laughs> what advice would you give to this next generation of leaders? Because even with uh, I'll be 30 next year, God willing, you'll be 29. Yeah. We're even moving past two and three generations. <laughs> so what, what, would you, what advice would you give to that young leader, that young professional who will watch this, uh, young visionary? What advice would you <clears throat> give to them from a, from a spiritual standpoint and a corporate standpoint? Sure. And I, I love how you said earlier that the spiritual and the, the natural, we're talking corporate, the leadership principles you know, they, they, they trans, transcend both yes. areas, right? Yes. Number one, again, as I've said, stay with God. That's so good. Keep God at the center. And I yes. think it's important, especially in the age that we're dealing with, because our generation and the next generation has to deal with voices that we don't even know more now than ever before right. because of social media. Right. Everyone has a commentary. Everyone has a platform. Everyone yep. has an opinion. Keep God's voice as the only voice that matters in your life. Mm -hmm. if you want to keep going with God and be the leader that God has called you to be. Number two, know who you are. Right. You and I, are we're brothers, right. but we're different. Right. And a lot of times, especially when we talk about preachers or even leaders in the corporate America setting or a corporate setting, whatever organization that you're in, we try to model ourselves after another person. Right. If two of us are the same, one of us is not needed, mm -hmm. right? That's so true. And so we have to be uniquely us. And what we don't realize, what we fail to realize rather, a lot of times is that if we are not us, there is a group of people goes back to the ship that are assigned to our voice that we are missing because we're trying to be somebody else, right? What I have is for a group of people. What you have is for a group of people and they need George. Mm -hmm. They don't need Lafayette. Mm -hmm. They need Lafayette, they don't need George, right? right? And so I would say that And number three, Keep yourself informed. What do I mean by that? From a spiritual perspective, especially young preachers as we are, yes. of course we should be keeping ourselves in the Word of God. Right. But in conjunction, along with the Word of God, we should constantly be reading. I try to read at least one book a week. Good. Because the more information that you have, the better job that you can effectively reach people. There was an older preacher that said, you can tell the strength and the effectiveness of a preacher by how strong his library is. That's so good. So if, if you're not doing anything but scrolling on Facebook and Instagram, right, right. if you're not filling your mind, yeah. whether that would be on leadership books, on spiritual books, on sociology, psychology, then I question how relatable your message is when you preach, but not just when you preach, but when you effectively try to lead and serve and disciple other people. Right. Because the more you know, the better job you can do. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Well, there you have it, everybody. We wanted just to take <laughs> the time to uh, ask Elder Lane these questions. Uh, we know that he's preparing to watch the Buckeyes tonight. <laughs> so we, wanted, we don't want to be too long with our interviews, but we want to Absolutely. thank everybody for tuning in. I want to thank, thank Elder Lane and his family for allowing him to do this, yeah. we ask that you follow us on Facebook, yeah. Instagram, and YouTube at A Call to Be Different Ministries, and yeah. just subscribe, like, share the interview, and uh, yeah, let's just stay connected for kingdom building purposes. And then Elder Lane, can you tell us where they can follow you and your wow. podcast as well? Sure, you can follow me on all social media platforms at Lafayette B Lane, L-A-F-A-Y-E-T-T-E, -T -T -E, 
B L A N E on all social media. I would love to connect with you there. My podcast is available on all streaming platforms and also on YouTube. Unscripted Authentic Leadership Podcast, where I'm blessed to lead that podcast along with my brother, John LeBron. Go there, leave us a review, leave us a rating on Apple Podcasts. Let us know how you like it. And again, man, thank you for this opportunity to be here with all of you on a call to be different. Yes. All right, man. God bless you. I appreciate you. Love you too.